everyone. Um, I'm Eric Dyer, uh, architect and board member of AIA Monterey Bay. Thank you for coming to our second presentation of AIA Monterey Bay's 2023 Arts and Architecture Lecture Series, Housing, Finding Solutions with Architecture. I first want to uh, welcome any public figures we have. I know we have Supervisor Mary Adams from Monterey County. Mary. And I saw Councilperson Jeff Barron from the City of Carmel. Jeff. And if I've missed anybody, please let me know. Um, I'd like to thank Sandbox and the creator of Sandbox, Michelle Jokic, who's standing back there. Michelle, thank you. Um, please go to Sandbox Sand City. They Dot com. They put on some amazing programs here, world-class music and other arts events, um, and you can see all that all on the website. Um, uh, personally, I want to thank the AIA, board, AIA Monterey Bay's Board of Directors and members of the Arts and Arch Architecture Committee, as well as our Executive Director, Shermaine Jones, back there. Shermaine, thank you. I'd like to thank the Pine Inn and Carmel for providing rooms for our speakers in our series this year. And tonight, I'd especially like to thank and acknowledge the sponsors of tonight's event, Midpin Housing. And I believe there's people here. If you're from Midpin, you want to stand up, and, or you can wave. <laughs> you, look, you look very comfortable, so I won't make you get up. Thank you for sponsoring our event tonight. Um, I think many of you were here for the first talk from Liam Dillon of the Los Angeles Times and his Gimme Shelter podcast, which took on an understanding of the housing crisis and more policy-oriented ways which, we are being which are being used to combat it. If you missed it, we're actually putting all our lectures on our website, aiamontereybay.org. So go to that and uh, you can re-see it or see it for the first time to catch up. Tonight's event should be on the website in a, in a week or two. Um, tonight we look more specifically at ways architecture and design can create great spaces for people to live and live more densely, more equitably, and more sustainably. And before I introduce tonight's speakers, I'd like to make sure everyone puts uh, our final two presentations on the, of the series on their calendar, April 27th. We're very excited and honored to have um, the 2022 AIA National Gold Medal winners, which is the highest national award the AIA gives out, um, it's Larry Scarpa and Angie Brooks of Brooks Scarpa. Angie, Larry, and their firm have done world-renowned work in housing, and we'll talk about dense cities, housing for quality of life, and social change. And our presentation May 18th will be a community forum and panel discussion bringing together public figures, planners, housing advocates, and developers to really get at ways we can move forward here on the Central Coast to get more housing built in the right places at the right scale at all income levels. So please go online and register for those now. Uh, this evening, we're really fortunate to have two principals from the prolific firm David Baker Architects. Over the past 40 years, DBA has created a lot of wonderful designed housing. I think it's 15,000 units built, half of them affordable. And they've really pioneered multifamily housing development in the San Francisco area and the Bay Area and they now do work all over the country. Um, I've come to realize just how many housing projects I really enjoy in San Francisco and how many are actually designed by DBA. Just a few months ago, I was walking around the Petrel, Petrel Hill area um, in the city and walking to my favorite breakfast place, Plow, if you know it, it's really <laughs> and came across another great multifamily project. The building form had a, such a rich and variable composition and materiality, stepping down with the topography along the sloping streets. And instead of a standard donut layout with a perimeter of the building and just a rectilinear courtyard in the middle, uh, what they created was this great landscaped interblock walkway through the middle of it. Uh, it was this really wonderful place that uh, you know could be enjoyed by the residents and as well as all the public in the neighborhood walking through it. Of course, I later found that it was another great DBA project, Mason on Mariposa, I think you call it, and we took the liberty of using it on our website. It's such a great project. Um, DBA has set up and stuck to core values of keeping the human experience and human dignity at the center 
of what they do using sustainability, urbanism, and community. And they've now written a book which takes this accumulated body of knowledge and experience and puts it down and puts down the actual strategies that they implement to achieve these great results. And it's simply titled Nine Ways to Make Housing for People, which we are all going to learn about tonight. So please join me in welcoming two principals of David Baker Architects and co-authors of the new book, Daniel Simons, FAIA, and Padram Farashbandi, AIA. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, if you haven't heard Angie and Larry speak, come to the next one of these, because they're really great architects and they give really great presentation. Um, they're also good friends of ours. Uh, so yeah, just a little plug. Um, so yeah, our firm has been around for about 40 years. I've been a principal for, I don't know, 10. I've worked there for almost 25 years. And uh, we have, just run through a little bit about where we are. Um, so we have about 60 people now, three different offices. We have an office in San Francisco, one in Oakland, and another one in um, Birmingham, Alabama, which is a long story. Um, <laughs> but the Birmingham, Alabama office is doing really well. We've got 10 people down there. Um, so we do architecture on all scales, from like single family homes to um, kind of master plans. Um, but housing, like multifamily housing, is a core business of ours. We've been doing it for forever, um, since the very beginning. Um, we have kind of embraced modular technology, uh, recently doing a whole handful of modular projects around the Bay Area. Um, we do some hospitality work as well. We design hotels, uh, mostly small boutique hotels. Uh, this is one that we just finished up in Healdsburg, California. Um, and then also at the larger scale, like urban design, um, so master plans of you know, 15, 20, 50 acres. Um, we have a small interiors department um, that does most of the interiors for our projects as well as occasionally for other things like this wine bar, um, which is in Birmingham. Um, and then we have a fabrication shop. Uh, so we have uh, a few full-time fabricators that build custom elements in our project. So this is a 100% affordable project in San Francisco and we built the bench and the and the roof over the top of it, um, which was fun. Uh, we also have what we call DBA Lab, which is our kind of pro bono experimental side of things. So this is a project site for a project which someday will get built. But in the interim, uh, we worked with our client to um, build some temporary booths and a stage. Um, we actually used little, some of these little things here. These are. These are cribs that are used when modular boxes get brought out to the site. They have to be set down on something temporary uh, before they get, so we, we stole a bunch of them and uh, painted the tops of them bright colors and used them as benches. Um, so yeah, and this is now uh, an event space for one of our nonprofit clients in Oakland. Um, but what we're here to talk about today is a book that we wrote, um, which has been a long time coming. Um, yeah, don't ever write a book. Uh, it's really been a labor of love, and it started, um, I think, six or seven years ago when the Cooper Hewitt asked us um, to participate in a, an exhibit, and they said, oh, we're doing uh, uh, an exhibit about community-based design, and we'd love you to send a model or a rendering of a project that you've done. And we, we said, well, hmm, you know, what, what should we send? And we really got kind of stuck on like, which project and why are we sending it? And so we started thinking about what it was that we wanted to present to this, to this, uh, to this exhibit. And we started talking about things that were like core principles of the way we approach design. Um, so that was where the, the genesis of the nine ways came. And then we started giving presentations and people kept saying, you should write a book. And we foolishly listened to them. Uh, so then we decided to write a book and, uh, and here we are. Um, so, we had a lot of fun with the book. We worked with a graphic designer friend of ours and came up with little symbols for each one of the nine ways. Um, and we're gonna kind of run through the ways today. Um, um, but they're also all in the book. Um, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is reweaving the urban fabric. And this is really less on a building scale and more thinking about neighborhoods and how buildings and the projects we do can 
kind of repair or, um, or kind of be positive interventions in the neighborhoods that we work in. Um, and the project I'm going to talk about First is one that we did for the Oakland Housing Authority, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really challenging site. It was an existing housing authority project um, and an old pasta factory that was right on the edge of a really um, in big industrial neighborhood um, and, uh, and a really small-scale residential neighborhood. So we were, we were kind of straddling the border between the two and trying to make it more livable. This was the existing housing authority project. Uh, there was a, the existing housing authority project was here. This was the pasta factory, and this was the loading dock for the pasta factory. Um, so when we started the project, we, we were just you know familiarizing ourselves with the neighborhood and trying to understand what was what was out there. And what we realized was there actually were a lot of incredible assets for this neighborhood that were really close by, but they were just completely disconnected from each other. And um, and so we had you know a new school and a library, um, a rec center, a church. Uh, and a park, um, but you actually couldn't walk. Like when, before we did this project, to walk from the church to the library, you would have had to gone like this. So there was no, like these assets, these, these things weren't, they didn't feel like a community. And so we had this opportunity to sort of to create the community. Uh, this was the existing housing authority project, which was pretty run down. Um, my first community meeting there was me and, and a bunch of rats. And, uh, and a few people who were, you know, living here, it was really sad, and all they wanted to do was leave. Like, they were just like, when are you going to tear these things down so we can take my voucher and leave Oakland? Um, so we wanted to create something that changed this place and made it um, something that was more for people. Um, so we created a series of different scales of buildings, um, from townhouses to apartment buildings. Um, kind of connected with these pedestrian connections through um, play areas for kids. Um, and yeah, just a whole series of outdoor spaces and different scales of buildings. Yeah. Me? OK. Uh, um, so another kind of core principle, this idea of connecting um, so when you think of making a place for someone to live, there is the sort of physical needs of you know, shelter, place to sleep, cook, so forth and so on. But also, I mean, what really makes a place to live is the community that you have there, the people that you're connected with, and that's what makes it feel like home. And so you know, these large multifamily buildings can be kind of impersonal. And so trying to figure out ways to uh, encourage people to connect with each other. And um, some of that can be done with architecture. A lot of it has to do with other things. But what we found is that if we put the places where people happen to go together <laughs> in one area, then if you're going to get your mail, or you're going to do your laundry, or you're going to talk to someone in the property management office or the services office, there's just it increases the odds that you're going to run into somebody see them over and over again, maybe strike up a conversation and sort of begin to connect with each other. Um, so yeah, uh, shout out to MidPen. This is <laughs> the sponsor tonight, uh, Nevada, who's sitting in the front row, and I worked on this project for many, many years. Um, but this is a perfect example of that. So we have a big community center, we've got a, a, a community garden, we have a laundry room, um, there's like a little lounge back here which has a TV and a PlayStation, and then there's an after school program um, that also is here. So all of these activities around this community space makes this really like a hub. There's like a lot of different ages of people and different kinds of folks who show up here, and then they all can, um, can, can you know, connect with each other. We were so successful, actually, at making this a place for kids that actually this, this part of out here, there's like uh, AstroTurf, which was all planted with like shrubs and trees and so forth. And there were so many kids here, and they all hung out here, that they destroyed all of that landscaping. So we tore it out and just said, we're just going to make it all AstroTurf. Um, and it's worked great ever since. So lessons learned. So there's just this idea of connections um, this is another project, uh, this is in San Francisco, similarly um, 
kind of has a lot of different things, like a little path around it for kids to ride their tricycles. There's a lounge, a gym, um, laundry, uh, you know, all of these things are connected. There's a community room, and you can kind of see from the lounge down into the community room. There's a, you know, an outdoor space for barbecuing. So having all these things connected and um, having a place for people to be, this is up on the second level of that um, sort of continued AstroTurf theme. This time we decided to use blue, um, which, uh, which was really popular with a lot of the kids. Again, looking out from one of those lounges out to that walkway. Um, again, just like finding places for people to sort of sit informally, connect with each other. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Pedro. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So yeah, another principle is make big moves and it's really about you know, acknowledging that housing essentially is a commodity and you know they get nibbled around the edges so it's basically when our clients tell us you can afford all those beautiful details or materials it still can make a statement um, and then usually for that we look into the context and see where we can get that concept and what that big move is for example this is Tohanan in San Francisco supportive housing project uh, it's you know SROs so all their residents only have one window. And it's essentially right in front of a jail. And there were a lot of negative feelings about it. So we're thinking, well, how can we, you know, maybe turn the windows away from the jail and then so they look into downtown San Francisco view. So that, that you know, basically became the project. Uh, here's another example, two projects of ours framing this beautiful building that is really probably one of the nicest buildings in San Francisco. And then the, the moves is about like framing and acknowledging the view. So one with the concave and one with the con convex um, curve. Uh, this is also another affordable housing project. It's a, in a historic context. And then what we realize is a lot of the buildings around the project were uh, horizontally layered and our building was very vertical uh, so that's where we said okay so how about if we twist these boxes on top of each other to respect the uh, neighbors also that created these notches that lined up with some of the neighboring buildings um, and then uh, you know if if you take the beautiful details still those moves are still there uh, another principle is probably a lot of us are familiar with, probably not in this terminology, is a little goes a long way. Again, this is saying, okay, we have housing. A lot of it is the function of housing people. Uh, not all of it can have the beautiful, nicely detailed uh, facade. So for instance, in this project, we identified you know, the most prominent facade, essentially. It's against a public park. It's nicely detailed court and facade with custom perf patterns. And then, you know, the rest of the building, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's stucco. Uh, th this is another project that we saw earlier. Uh, again, identifying that corner, we probably have 10 different custom bricks. Uh, so it's like shimmering in light really nicely. Uh, and then also like the sun shades around that, it's, it's really custom made and well taught. Uh, and then it's really focusing our uh, attention to, to the important corners and areas. Another project, uh, this is also paying attention to where people are. Uh, I think with modern architecture, sometimes they tend to get a little bit cold and then bringing the, uh, basically the nice materials and nice details to where people are. For instance, in this project, we have wood where people can touch it and entering the building and you know, bring some warmth to the project and also the nice custom brick pattern also pointing to that entry. Uh, another concept is about activating the edges, which is mostly about the ground floor and what we put on the ground floor because it's so easy to think about the function of the building and then put transformer rooms and garage entries, trash rooms there. And you know, it's because that's where they essentially want to be. Uh, and then that becomes a dead space essentially if, if we're not actively working towards uh, having a nice ground floor. So this is a, 
an example of, uh, you know, thinking about the ground floor, have a lot of active uses on the ground floor where it matters. Uh, it's actually, and then think about how we divide them so they actually can function. Uh, so it essentially becomes a very lively ground floor. Uh, and then these are the ideas. So it's not only about what use we do there. It's, it's also a little bit about height. Uh, this is interesting because we wrote this uh, article with Spur in San Francisco saying, you know, if we want to have a successful commercial, it has to have the right height. But a lot of times, because of the building height restrictions, we couldn't give them that height. And we got the planning department to approve, basically, saying now it's citywide that you can, if you provide commercial, you can increase the height. Uh, so that, that was a success. And, you know, 10 foot really doesn't work for ground floor units or ground floor uh, retail. So at 12 foot, you know, you start getting a little bit okay. You know, you can have like high your mechanicals coming from above and you get a stoop for your residential. 17 foot, it's where it started, like where magic starts to happen. You can have, you know, loft or a mezzanine level. Uh, you can make the parking a little bit more efficient. You'd have stackers. And then 20 is, is really great because, uh, you know, you can have townhouses and it's, it doesn't cost that much more. Uh, it's really interesting if you ask people what their favorite cafe is, and then you say, okay, what's above it? They usually can't tell you. It's because we think about the first 20 feet, really, when you're uh, experiencing a city. That's how we developed this concept about the Q zone. For a long time, I thought it uh, stands for quality, but it really stands for quirky. Uh, it's about giving back to the public realm. Uh, so the yellow line here shows the, where the property line is. And then we just gave it back to the sidewalk. So when you're walking on the sidewalk, you can't tell where the property line is. And it feels like it's part of the sidewalk. So what was a really cramped sidewalk, now it feels great. And then it, really, it basically allows the retail on the ground floor to breathe out. Uh, here's another example of you know, respect and giving back to the public realm. Uh, this is a really fancy restaurant there. You can buy a $30 burger. Uh, uh, it also like, allows for things like stoops at the residential entries. Uh, stoops are also, it gives people, not only it's a buffer, but also it gives people an opportunity to uh, personalize their, their front entry. And this is where the quirkiness is going to happen. It's a little bit against modern architecture principles where everything needs to be designed and elegant. It allows that quirkiness. And, you know, it, I think we, we want to celebrate that. Uh, it's also allowing flexibility on the ground floor because during time, like some places, not at the beginning, a commercial space can happen and then through time it changes and you know, it may become residential and then later on becomes uh, commercial. Like this is, in this example, this was a PDR zone. We didn't know what it means at the time. So we allowed for flexibility that you know, this could be really small spaces, but also they could combine it together, maybe a couple of them and then have a smaller one or all of it as one space essentially. Uh, that's really what happened. Uh, CCA College came and took the entire ground floor. Uh, they also used the sidewalk as their circulation, so it really activated that, um, that frontage. Uh, probably if we came up with that idea, they would say, no, you can't have the sidewalk as the circulation, but glad that wasn't the case. Uh, the other concept is about the you know, it's about bringing light into your circulation, your corridors, your stair. It's like opposite of what you see in Las Vegas, where, you know, that you basically disconnect from the daylight and nighttime. You can't tell what it is. It's exactly the opposite of it. Uh, this project is in Charleston, senior housing. It's like the, the god of enlightening circulations, where <laughs> uh, the corridor essentially becomes porches. Uh, there, we made them really wide, and you know, people essentially use them as front porches. Uh, the developer provided these rocking chairs, and people really liked them. And you know, through time, people started taking over. Uh, again, probably some modern architects will freak out seeing this photo, but 
you know, it, it really feels like home for those people. Uh, this is another example. We had this project right against uh, the freeway. So naturally, we would put the circulation as a sound buffer between the freeway and the housing, and the, the housing can look into the homes. But also, it had a great view to downtown San Francisco. So we made it really you know, open. And then you can, it still act as a sound buffer because it's enclosed, but it's, it's really uh, open in terms of the view. We also put the building side on a building sign on the inside, and we didn't have to get a permit because it was inside the building. <laughs> uh, this is an underground packet, uh, passage to uh, common spaces in one of the affordable housing projects. Uh, and then at the end of the hallway, we put this light well, and it basically completely changed the feel of the uh, the walkway. You, you don't feel like you're in a basement anymore. Uh, and then at the end, we have this beautiful uh, light well, essentially. Uh, what, you know, in section, it felt like, oh, what do we do with this basement? But then just bringing light into it completely changed the vibe of it. This, this is it from above, which is this, you know, Andrew Cochran was the landscape architect. She, she's amazing and makes our projects really nice. I think that's you again. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we, we struggled with when we started this was that some of the things seemed too obvious. Uh, like, but yet, still, I think sometimes you forget them. So be welcoming is really just like making a nice front door so like people know where to come into the building. Um, and it's, it does, like I said, seems so simple, but yet there are so many buildings where you don't know where to go, right? Like there's no indication. And there isn't, you're not celebrating that sense of entry. So um, creating some space for people to hang out where they can kind of be um, waiting for their friends or uh, greeting people as they come in, kind of having a view through to a courtyard so it feels like it's really a special place. Um, in this instance, we, uh, we were working um, in a heavily African-American neighborhood and um, they wanted to sort of, they wanted some of the building to, not, to feel um, Afrocentric. They didn't know what that meant. And so we spent a lot of time sort of talking with them about like what, what does that mean and what does it mean to you? And so we ended up coming up with this idea of this big like sculptural element that, um, that was faceted and uh, and they loved it, and it really does just sort of set off what is otherwise a relatively straightforward uh, rectilinear building. Um, similarly here, we have a project that, uh, that's in a really busy, dense urban neighborhood. It's in the um, Hayes Valley in San Francisco, um, and it's like a few feet away from, um, from Goff, which is one of the big, busiest streets. It's like, you know, cars all the time. And so what does it feel like to come home when you're walking there? And so having a sense of, coming through a gate and walking up um, a ramp through a courtyard where there's planting, uh, this, this transition space, this decompression space that sort of gives you a sense of being somewhere as opposed to being on a really busy street. And you come up here um, and you walk up to this beautiful custom wood front door. This is not affordable housing, though. Uh, and then the view back out into that courtyard um, through, uh, through a glass wall um, that sort of blurs the barrier between interior and exterior. Um, this is affordable housing. Uh, so similarly here, having this front door is, again, a busy urban area. Um, but um, so we have what's a wall, and there's a nice door in it. You walk through it. But when you get into the other side, you're actually not indoors. You're actually open to the courtyard. So. It, it's, again, this sort of transition space where you come home and you're in this kind of wonderful, peaceful garden as you come through the front door as opposed to um, being on a street. Um, Art for All, again, really pretty straightforward idea, but just thinking about art and how we can bring it into our projects um, and how it can uh, help with wayfinding or identity or other aspects of the project. Um, so whether it's just a, uh, we work a lot with a really wonderful organization in San Francisco called um, Creativity Explored, which is a, um, 
an organization that helps uh, people with artists with um, developmental disabilities, um, and they've been really generous about licensing their art to us and letting us like print it really big and cover walls with it. So that's what this wall in a community room. Um, similarly here, uh, we took um, a series of pieces by the same artists that were in different color palettes and printed them and put them as you walk up the front uh, out of the elevator uh, so that you know what floor you're on by the color of the art that you, that you see when you come, when you come home. Um, here's all the different floors. Um, this was a, like a San Jose State student whose sculpture we loved. <laughs> So we just bought a bunch of his pieces and put them in our buildings. So finding ways to just get art that's not necessarily expensive or precious, um, but really kind of still creates that sense of community. Um, so again, I think one of the real challenges with multifamily housing is that it can feel really impersonal. It can feel like um, you're just one unit in a huge complex and you go up an elevator and you walk down a long corridor and your door looks like everybody else's door. And so how do you combat that? Like how do you create something that actually feels like it's yours or it belongs to you? Um, so that can be like on a neighborhood scale. Um, so again, this is a project in um, a different, also very heavily African-American uh, neighborhood that really wanted to, again to have like Afrocentric architecture. So we spent a lot of time like, talking with them about it. And one of the things that really came out was the idea that like they didn't want it to all be rectilinear, that they really wanted it to have some sort of bold curves and shapes. Um, so we did, we created this big kind of big circulation curve. Um, and then the color palette was also um, inspired by, um, by some, uh, by some um, African art. Um, but that personalization can also be creating uh, places for people to grow their own vegetables um, or just have a place where you can hang out and talk to your neighbor outside your front door. Um, those doors don't all have to be the same color, you know, just so I'm get off the elevator, you go right, I'm the purple door. Uh, just giving a little something that it just feels like it's not the same as everybody else. Um, we do this a lot, we, we create places outside the front door with a little shelf where you can put something out. Um, you know, again, these can be really simple, uh, but you know, come Halloween or Christmas, people put out their decorations, they sort of take ownership of it. And again, it's just this, these, these ways that people can do things that feel, hmm, that's odd. Uh, sorry about the image. Um, this is another one where we, uh, here, hopefully move on. So the first picture was of a, a weed, essentially. I like to think of it as a weed. But actually, the artist who we were working with pointed out that it was a native plant and that she really wanted to um, glorify it. And so she painted this mural, which is you know five stories tall, of this little tiny native plant. And that sort of grounds it in a place. But what is really wonderful, again, I don't know what that is. You have to is. guess what it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is a community meeting um, that she held, which was really great, um, where she talked with the people in the building and said, what can we do to the ground floor of this mural where you actually interact with it and do something that is of the place where you are? So I think there were like 10 or 12 different languages that were spoken in there. And they said, we really want to have all of our languages represented. And it says, so it says, welcome. Um, and then it also has a little spot here, which you can't see because it's super blurry, where there was a, an idea of creating an image which was their vision of what this neighborhood could be. So there's the building. Um, but across the street in an area which was um, sort of an old, uh, well, we'll go to that story. But it's not, 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 not a great place to be across the street. It was, you know, there was a lot of um, waste that needed to be cleaned up. And they said, well, we want this to be this vision of like a wind powered, you know, sustainable garden across the street. So this base, you know, there's the wheat, the plant that's going up four stories, but the ground is sort of, the roots of it are the people who live there and the community that's of it. So it really, it brings something of the people who are living in the building to the expression on the outside of the building. Um, 
That get personal can also be just meeting with people ahead of projects and understanding their community. So whether we're doing community meetings or um, design charrettes, um, uh, it's a way of kind of like connecting with folks and sort of getting their ideas of what the building should be and making sure that what, what we're designing is something that they're proud of. Um, and I think that, you know, at the end of the day, it's really important to remember that these are people who just want to have a life and that you're not designing. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy for housing to become this commodity, right? It is actually like, um, you know, a lot of housing that gets built, it's just like repetitive and it's the same and we have to produce it because in the state of California, we don't have enough and that's true. But ultimately, you know, people have to live there and you want to make it a place that people really feel like that they can make their own and that they can have lives in it. Um, so that's the end of our formal presentation. Um, we do have a book. It's available online if you want to order it. And I think we have a couple that we're going to wrap off. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel and uh, Ron. I think, I think we definitely wanted to do a Q&A. That was a lot of information that you covered in a short time. Yes. But I think first we have two books here that can be uh, raffled off. And we have a hat. Did everyone get a chance to put a business card or some other thing to get a book? Okay, no more offers? Okay, so do you want to? <laughs> we can pick two. You can pick one and Petron can two. There you go. Shermaine. Ah, it's Shermaine. You're using my card. Okay. Brian Clark. Oh, Brian got it. Okay. And then Dan Curran. Dan, I saw you here. Oh. There you go. Great. So, Brian. Brian, how do you do? I think, I think you. I do. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess so. So we are videoing this so we can um, put it up online and everyone can view it. So we just need to have people ask the questions into a microphone. So we'll start with Jim. Oh, that was really wonderful. Um, I know that you're doing a lot of work with prefab and I'm wondering kind of taking it from design strategies to sort of the more implementation of things and, and how you're implementing that and using that as a strategy. You did show one project, it's kind of amazing, which I drive by all the time and I didn't know it was prefab. <laughs> and um, just maybe have some words around um, how you're doing that and, and how, how that's going and the, and the general success around it or challenges around it? Yeah, um, I think we have, I don't know, five or six projects that are modular that are built and yeah. another few in the pipeline. So we've definitely kind of invested in trying to figure out what the technology is all about and, um, and had lots of successes and lots of failures. Um, so I think that the the most important thing in my mind is to really kind of understand the constraints of the technology and design within them. I think, especially in an emerging technology that's trying to market itself broadly, there's a lot of promises that they can kind of do anything. And it is true that, like, technically true that they can do anything, but they do certain things really well and other things not so well. And I think that if you kind of stick to their strengths, um, you're going to end up kind of seeing more of the like cost and time savings that is promised with the technology and you're also just going to have a lot less kind of like heartburn kind of butting up against the limitations of the technology. So really what that means is that modular buildings, you want to kind of maximize the amount of work that gets done in the factory. So um, the way the boxes are put together is that typically they're like both sides of the corridor and the corridor and the two sides of the corridor are finished and the corridor is left unfinished for sort of like connecting all the utilities and everything. And they can be a certain width because that's what fits on a truck and a certain height because that's what fits on a truck. And so when you think about that, like 
that's really good for certain things like uh, studio apartments. Right, right, exactly. Like SROs are a home run for uh, modular. Um, hotels are really good for modular. So we did a hotel. Um, when you start getting into like large two, three bedroom apartments, um, it gets more complicated because you have to kind of connect units, apartments across boxes. And while that's totally doable, it like, it just, it adds the amount of work that needs to be done on site and then workers are coming into the apartments and the apartments are finished, they damage the work, they do other things. And so, but where we do have those, really like limiting what the connection is. So like if it's just a door that like somebody has to like, it's already in there and they just frame the door and trim it, that's great. If it's like a huge opening where they have to like take out a temporary wall and sheet rocket, like that's not so good. Um, so kind of learning those lessons and sort of realizing what you can and can't, what, like I said, not what you can't do, but maybe what you don't really want to do, I think has been the key to success for us. Do you see it becoming more popular and more relevant? Um, I don't know. Uh, I would say uh, my, um, all of my clients that have done modular projects have only done one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can take it back. I have one client that's done multiple, but they're the ones who started the factory. Yeah. Oh, one second. One second. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Governor Brown and then carried on by uh, Governor Newsom were both realizing that the extreme issues on the cost of affordability of housing in California is stymied at the local county city level. So they were trying to recoup the power by taking the teeth out of CEQA and EIRs, specifically traffic reports. Traffic reports stopping every development and starting litigation. So in that regard, Monterey County for the last 10 years has produced virtually zero, zero, zero affordable housing. And so the buy right new rules of regulations, if you have affordable housing and don't meet those requirements, then by right, you can come in and get permits and build that development. You no longer have to go before the planning commission. You no longer have to go before the board of supervisors. But yet in Monterey County in 10 years, we have produced virtually zero affordable housing. Why is that? Monterey County meets one box, one box, and that is we provide enough market rate housing. So since we provide enough market rate housing, we do not have to provide any affordable housing by right. So therefore, again, there is virtually no affordable housing because it gets turned down. On that level, have you done any by right permitting processes with projects that have affordable housing that comply with the new CEQA regulations relating to EIRs and even more specifically relating to new inter interpretations and regulations of traffic reports that cannot stop a development in their tracks. So have you done any permits by right as it relates to affordable housing? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, there, I mean, obviously there's a whole lot of legislation that's happened at the state level that sort of incent, that sort of taken the power away from local jurisdictions. There's a couple of bills, uh, SB 35 and AB 2162, which are specifically targeted at 100% affordable projects. And they, they have been very, very effective at, um, at kind of streamlining the approval process and we have, I don't know, a dozen, maybe more projects more, yeah. Yeah, that have used those tools. Um, and it doesn't happen as fast as it's supposed to, according to the state legislations. The local jurisdictions have gotten really smart at kind of figuring out ways to sort of not meet the time, statutory time limits and the laws and so forth and so on. But at the end of the day, it has really 
changed the discussion, and it has, um, and it has, it has, you know, it, it's much easier, especially in local areas that um, that have really organized and active um, NIMBY groups. It's taken a lot of the teeth out of out of their, you know, ability to slow down projects. So I definitely see a change, and I and it, it has been a positive effect. It's not. It's you know it's not as all powerful as we would like it to be. Um, I think it's still really hard <laughs> to get things approved. It still really takes a long time. Um, but but yeah, it's definitely changed. The state laws have really really helped us. And it varies sure. a lot from jurisdictions to jurisdictions. Some some cities still don't believe. Yeah. In the state law, but we've been in planning commissions where commissioners said, we don't want to pro approve this project, but we have to. So that just shows that if the legislation wasn't there, we wouldn't get this affordable housing project approved. So it is working to some degree. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm just curious, how many, uh, have you found an uptick in, in people from different communities around the state looking to do housing and coming to you for that with the recent legislation that has been kind of pressuring the community, different communities in the state? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, we're definitely, I feel like there are definitely communities that we're working in that we might not have been working in five or 10 years ago because people are, you know, taking on those communities. And I think, but also it is that there is a change. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's like the city staff and the and the and the politicians want more housing, but they're they're also they've been hamstrung by these community groups and attorneys who are very good at suing over CEQA. and so a lot of times we find that they're really they want to use these new tools like they're excited about it, but they actually don't know how like they haven't done it, and so a lot of what we do and the developers we work with do is kind of educating them about, oh no, you don't have to do that. You know, you, this is okay, you can approve this. You don't have to like, well, that isn't really an objective standard. It does not apply to this project. You don't, like helping them kind of understand has actually been an important part of kind of the last few years. And we found a lot, I would say more jurisdictions are excited about that than resistant to it. But there are definitely some, as Pedram says, that kind of use whatever they can to kind of subvert the new things that are out there. So they have their ways. Um, and, you know, so you have to kind of, it can be more of a fight. And in some cases, you know, it ends up in court. Um, but that's all part of the, part of the fun of development. <laughs> oh, wait, one second, sir. I just want to get you on the... Can, they, you can't hear yourself on the video if you don't. Um, how are the parking requirements changing? Um, I know it's deregulated for uh, like ADUs and things like that. The state's deregulated that, but is that deregulation happening also at multifamily? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that parking is a really interesting, it, again, is a really change. I mean, I think we did one of those projects I showed was a condo that was like parked at 0.5 and um, it's in San Francisco. And when we were, when we were, when we were building, this is like, I don't know how old, that project is almost 10 years old now or something. And you know, like the developers were like, oh, we can't find a lender who will lend to us because they don't believe that you can build a condo with like 0.5 parking ratio. And so like it, there were all these limitations to like the reduction in parking was allowed, but people were afraid that it wouldn't work. And I think that there's enough kind of proof of concept now that they realize that they don't have to build as much parking. I think what we're seeing with our affordable housing developers is that there's like another discussion around <clears throat> equity and like, it, is it, you know, are we taking people who, you know, really need cars for their livelihood or um, to participate in, you know, <coughs> like certain aspects of the economy and not giving them that opportunity 
in order to sort of save on the construction costs? And is that really fair? And you know, it's a it's a hard it's a hard balancing act. It's not, you know, it's not an easy answer. But in terms of the like regulatory controls that exist that allow us to do no parking or less parking, we have so many more. You know, state density bonus laws, um, other things that have really kind of been ratcheted up over the last few years. So it is very easy, especially in areas that have decent transit, to kind of to not build parking. And in the states, putting pressure on the cities to improve their transportation, right? So there's conflict going on there. Yeah, I mean, I think again, that's like one of these things that's really tough. I mean, I think that you know, if I'm being honest, you know, public transportation in California is awful, you know, and, and it isn't really getting any better. And so, you know, what, what has improved, I think, is um, other kinds of mobility, like, you know, car share or, um, you know, last mile technologies, like all these, like, electric bike systems or other things. Like, I, there is, there has been a sea change around some of that stuff, which makes kind of papers over some of the inadequacies of our public transportation system, but it still is not like 100% successful. And so I think we're building a lot of this housing for a future that we hope we will have where public transit will be better. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, bike lanes are great. You know, I'm a big cyclist, and I love the fact that I can now, you know, go to the grocery store from my house on a bike lane instead of worrying about being hit by a car. But is that really going to, like, make a huge change for, I don't know, it, uh, maybe at some point. Yeah, but it's also a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, too. You know, like, if you don't have the demand, the public transportation is not going to improve. So you want to, like, you know, move them together, essentially. Hi, I'm in Watsonville, and Pajaro just took a big flood. And if you were not hamstrung, and if you had a partner who could fund it, and there are 1,500 very low income, I think about 1,000 homes that who knows whether they'll be um, habitable sort of what would your solution, and I know you're trying, I know someone's trying to build farm worker housing there too, and they've hit a lot of roadblocks, but you know, if you could sort of blue sky it, what would you do with a community like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't know Watsonville that well. I mean, I think that, um, that, you know, what we have found, and I'll, my mid pen folks can talk about this better than I can, is that cities seem to think if they have land, they're done. I will give the developer free land and then it'll be fine. But that's not usually adequate. Like there has to be local funding. I mean, the truth is if you want affordable housing, you gotta have a bond or you have to raise taxes and you have to have a, a, a way to sort of subsidize because with all the sort of state and federal level funding and the free land, it's still not enough, right? Like we always talk about the gap, right? Like there, it gets you this close and then there's this. And that last little, that, that's the hardest bit. And the local jurisdictions really need to step up if they want to change that things. Side. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we would start by probably spending a lot of time in the community and talking to people and understanding like what the needs of the people are. I mean, I think that the project that Padram talked a little bit about that was in Charleston, South Carolina, like I'd never been to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and so I didn't know anything about that community. Um, and so going out there and kind of meeting people and talking to them and understanding what it is that's important to them, I think would probably be the most important first step. Um, and that hopefully from there we would kind of find some inspiration and you know I don't like I said I'm not super familiar with Watsonville so I don't know I don't know what that would be. The other side of the river is Pajaro. Uh -huh. It's a different little it's a different town. Uh -huh. Different county. Pajaro is Monterey County. Okay. Watsonville is doing okay. 
Kaharo is the place that's been absolutely decimated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, resilience is something that we talk a lot about in our office, is like thinking about how, and what we found, again, is that we're really lucky to work with really great nonprofit organizations like MinPen, but there's also many others in the Bay Area, and they're really committed to not just being like a housing provider, but being like a real partner to the community and strengthening them. And I think that there are, there's lots of opportunities with these investments of um, new affordable housing to think about how they can kind of help the resilience of the whole community by providing, you know, places in case of natural disaster or community rooms that can be used by other community groups that, you know, I mean, one of the things that, um, I can't remember exactly what the article was, it was a great article about sort of resilience of communities. And, you know, you think that it's mostly tied to like wealth and the technology and all these other things, but actually the like best predictor of a resilient community when hit with a natural disaster is how connected people are because they help each other. And that's like, so finding ways to sort of use this investment that you're making in your community to sort of like build up the resilience of the whole, whole neighborhood is I think definitely something that affordable housing can be a catalyst for. I have one quick question, maybe of the mid-pen people, not to. <laughs> so I know you sponsored us, but since you've worked with David Baker Architects, uh, is there things that set them apart or ways you like, particularly the way they work and as architects um, doing your housing? Is that something you, you don't have to answer. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nevada Merriman with MidPen. I'm here with many of my colleagues who have also worked deeply with this firm. Um, so I really like a few of the pieces of this presentation, especially things like a little go a long way. Like we are a cost conscious developer that only has so much to do so many things. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're trading the cost of your design sometimes with how many homes you can build or where the rents are set for those homes. So there's a lot of kind of bigger public policy decisions that you have to land on. Uh, but I've always felt like uh, Daniel in particular, where we have a very long relation, a 15 year relationship, um, really helps kind of work through some of the trade-offs. And you know, we work together to try to find a few places where we can really make them special. Uh, and you, you do see that our residents uh, connect with the communities that they live in. Uh, and I think the other thing is really um, careful site design. So many of the decisions that you make up front really set the impact uh, of everyday life. Uh, and so, um, especially in slightly more urban places where sound is a consideration, you're, you, you spoke to that with the way that the corridor was filled uh, mm -hmm. with light. But those are ways that you make higher density buildings livable. So I think that is something that I think um, you do exceptionally well. Yeah, I love how you created community and had the mailboxes where everybody came and the Children's Park. There was a book written about 30 years ago called Centerville, and a sociologist was teaching at the local high school and he did studies. He named the book Centerville because one of the towns where he taught, there was just a main street called Central Avenue and strip malls on either side. And the kids would drive to get the popcorn at Kmart, and then they would drive another 100 yards to get the liquor, and they would drive another 100 yards to get something else. And then they would go to a home that was you know, a box house of some kind. But if they could get in through the back door or could avoid the kitchen or the living room, things like this, they found these kids were more disconnected and they drank more, drugged more, et cetera, sexed more. The town next door, which was seven miles away, was a college town built around a plaza and just happened that the blocks were small, the apartment buildings were boxes, but there was some kind of connection between everybody and the drug and alcohol use among the teenagers was less. When you design a house or apartment building, in the same way that you've built up communities, are you designing the house or the apartment such that the kids go through the kitchen or the living room to get to their room so that they connect with others or connect with adults? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. I mean, I feel like 
I mean, not, not intentionally, uh, but honestly, most of our affordable housing projects, the apartments are pretty small, uh, and there's not a lot of place to hide. I mean, it's not like a big, you know, and they, you know, uh, and they tend to only have one front door. So, you know, I don't know. It's it's less of an. It's an interesting question, though. I do I do think that you know, in terms of like creating common spaces that have um, kind of like eyes on them, where people from various apartments can see, so that it does feel like a place where, you know, you're not supposed to do things that. You know, yeah. that you don't want to do things that you're not supposed to do. I think, you know, is part of kind of the way we think about security. But on, a, on an apartment level, I don't think we've ever... No, really but I was going to say, like, one of the principles we explain in lightening circulation, it, it's a little bit related to what you were explaining. Like, when instead of a dark corridor that you can hide, or like a stair that usually, if it's completely enclosed, uh, you know, those things can happen versus when it's, you know, exterior stair where you have eyes on. It's less places to hide, essentially. But inside the unit, as Daniel said, you know, we usually can afford the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question about um, moving to non-funded, state-funded or jurisdiction-funded projects and basically inclusionary housing, which I know you've worked on. Is there recommendations you may have on jurisdictions providing those incentives for for-profit developers to do projects and the percentage of inclusionary housing and is there a balance that you see working best or um, I think it's really hard to calculate the percentage um, I think that even in San Francisco which is you know like this incredibly hot residential market like I think they've actually pushed it a little bit too far and that the percentage kind of keeps ratcheting up and that there's very little market rate development right now in San Francisco um, and you know people point to a lot of reasons to that but the truth is the fact that you know you have to do 25% inclusionary is part of the reason you know and it's it's not we were part of a team that was trying to help advise the city of San Francisco on their inclusionary policy and we worked with folks, developers and finance people and kind of finding that like sweet spot, like really understanding where the market is, what cost of development is, when a project pencils, how much burden you can place on it and not kill it is, is, is hard. It's not, and it changes like constantly. So knowing, and you know, the regulations changed at a glacial pace right but the market changes like this so it's really hard to kind of happen to get it right i would say and um and sometimes it works out and you get inclusionary we have like you know uh one of the projects we showed was like a 450 unit market rate project in san francisco that was 20 percent affordable so it's like it's got a 90 unit like affordable housing project or the city of San Francisco for essentially free. You know, like that's amazing. But that just happened to work out, right? It was at a time when the you know, construction costs weren't that high and the market was going crazy and the developer was like, yes, I want to build this thing. And so it worked out. But yeah, it's really, I don't, I don't think there's a silver bullet. Um, I also think there is like, and maybe this is just me, but like I think that like we as a society share the responsibility to provide affordable housing. It seems a little unfair to me that like that burden should be placed on somebody who is building a new building. Like why does that person who decides they want to build a building have to solve the problem like a societal problem, right? Like if this is really a societal problem then somehow the solution should come from everybody living in the community not necessarily just the person who's building the new building. Or the people that buy in that building. Or the people who buy in that building. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm, my question is about, you know, the sustainable element in a, in a project, especially when you have a lot of units, like uh, doing agrivoltaics on the roof or concentrated solar or recovering gray water 
or doing all these things because if we keep building properties that need 100% from everywhere else, that's not a sustainable future. So when you have like a two acre site, you could heat the building with concentrated solar hot water and do things like that where it's, it seems like the, the scale would be good. So it's kind of like, uh, is that consciousness coming in to where like the roof space turns out to be the most important part of the building? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think there are limitations, you know, I think that um, if you think about like buildings that are, you know, zero net energy or zero net carbon or whatever, if that really is your goal that you're probably limiting density, especially in like urban sites, because like you said, there's a limited amount of roof space and, you know, if you want to do an eight story building, you probably can't support that. So like, would you rather have a building that doesn't use any energy or one that's a little bit bigger, you know, kind of like balancing those things, I think is something that we think about a lot. I think there's also some stuff that really makes more sense at like a district or city scale, like water reuse and water capture. Um, it's really expensive to do on a building scale. And like, if we're really, again, committed to it as like a society, then we should probably be investing in you know, water treatment plants that can, you know, create potable water and pump it back into our houses. Like at that scale, economically, it makes way more sense than trying to do it for a hundred units or 150 unit building. Um, but yeah, within the bounds of what makes sense, like economically, I think we try and do as much as we possibly can. And I think that, um, you know, the big change that's happened in the last few years is sort of realizing that if we are ever going to have a kind of carbon-free future, that we have to stop burning fossil fuels. <laughs> um, and that seems sort of obvious, but it's like, it's a, it's a pretty big one. So taking, um, you know, basically use, doing all electric buildings is kind of been a big push in our office. And I would say now, I don't know what percentage do you think it is? I would say all of it now. Pretty much all of our buildings now yeah. are 100% are electric. Um, and so kind of like working through the technologies that you need to do to sort of scale like water heating and other things for, for big buildings has been, has been a big effort over the last few years. Um, and it gives us the possibility that like as the grid gets clean, greener and we do some local production that we really can have like carbon neutral operation of these buildings. Great. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much, Patram and Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.